AP Biology, Chapter 42, Circulation in Animals, Part 1. This is a diagram of a generalized animal uh, showing the interaction of all the systems together. And this is not a particular animal. This is just to show you how the systems interact with each other. You do need to know this. It's not enough to just know how the digestive system functions or the circulatory system functions. How do they also interact with each other? And um, we're going to talk about that now. You don't have to copy this down, uh, but you should understand how these systems are connected. Once I get done with this explanation, uh, you should pause and go through how the different systems are connected as I explain. Here we have the digestive system. Remember, we have a complete digestive system. It's basically a tube inside of us. Uh, we, of course, have specialized bulges in that tube, like the stomach and large intestine. Nutrients are digested, broken down into monomers, and then absorbed into the bloodstream. Remember, that's uh, two of the four processes involved with uh, nutrition. We have ingestion digestion, absorption, and then elimination. The nutrients are absorbed uh, through the brush border of the small intestine into the bloodstream. So what's the point? Well, the bloodstream is going to take those nutrients, those amino acids, those glucose molecules, to every cell in the body. And how are we going to move it? Using this pump, the heart. And that's basically what a heart is. If you remember in plants, uh, we have transpiration that moves the water from the roots up to the leaves. And then we had active transport pushing the sugars down to the roots. We don't have that system. We have a pump. And that pump is higher maintenance. It requires a lot of energy. It's the only muscle in your body that never gets a break. You don't want it to get a break because you constantly need those um, oxygen molecules for cell respiration. All right, OK, over here we have the blue blood. The blue blood represents oxygen poor blood. And the blood is not actually blue. And that's something we'll talk, talk about later. Carbon dioxide will diffuse out of the blood into the lungs from high to low concentration. If you remember, that's called diffusion. Oxygen will be more pure in the lungs and go from its higher concentration in the lungs to the lower concentration in the blood. Now, by convention, we usually make the blood red if it's oxygen rich and blue if it's oxygen poor. But um, this does lead to some misunderstandings. It's actually kind of a purplish red color when it's oxygen poor and a bright red when it's oxygen rich. Now the blood has two things that's very important. We have the nutrients from the products of digestion. We have those monomers that we're going to need to build up our cell parts as well as fuel for cell respiration. And then we also have oxygen because that's going to be required in order for uh, electrons to be accepted as the final electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain in the interval to the mitochondria. Now over here we have all the cells of the body. Now, as you can see, it's only on the right side on this picture, but this represents all the cells, whether it's your big toe or your ear or your liver or any of the cells that need all the stuff they need to survive. Surrounding all your cells is something called interstitial fluid, and you really should know what that is, so if you want to write that down, you can. Interstitial fluid. It's the fluid surrounding the cells, which will be the medium for... Um, molecules like glucose and oxygen to be uh, moved around in. So what we're going to have is uh, diffusion, uh, typically, sometimes active transport, but mainly diffusion from the blood to the interstitial fluid. And then once you have the glucose and the oxygen and amino acids and that good stuff in the interstitial fluid, we have to get inside the cells. Now remember, there's three uh, ways to get small molecules inside cells. We have diffusion for things like oxygen, we have facilitated diffusion for things like glucose, and then we have active transport for things like sodium, potassium, and other ions. Also, we have to get rid of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a waste product of cell respiration and diffuses into the blood. The molecule that's going to be carrying uh, the oxygen as well as some of the carbon dioxide is hemoglobin, and some of that uh, oxygen carbon dioxide will just dissolve directly into the water of the blood that we'll talk about in a uh, later part of this uh, chapter. So now the blood has a bunch of carbon dioxide, waste products, and, and other nastiness. We can't have that in our body. So we have to get rid of it. And that's where the excretory system comes in. The excretory system gets rid of metabolic waste, which is different from the digestive system, which just gets rid of undigested wastes. So they're both wastes, but metabolic waste, or the breakdown of different chemical reactions, is mainly the job of the excretory system, which is a different chapter. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit about it now. Uh, even something simple like a worm uh, will have a system to get rid of uh, waste. 
things like flame cells that you don't have to know about. However, in mammals, which you do have to know about, the major organ to get rid of that waste from the blood is the kidney. The kidney is acting like a filter, so it's going to filter out all the nastiness in the blood, things like urea that we'll talk about in a future class. You don't have to know that now. If the person is diabetic, they're not getting enough sugar into their cells. They have hyperglycemia, which means they have high blood sugar, and that extra sugar also gets filtered out of the blood as well and gets uh, urinated. And that's what happens. Uh, basically, you mix it in with a lot of water to dilute it, and then you get rid of that nastiness, the metabolic waste, and that's why you uh, do a number one. All right, so review. This is how all those systems are connected. And as you can see, the circulatory system kind of connects everything together. It connects the digestive system with the uh, respiratory system, with the cells of the body, and the waste removal uh, system. So go ahead and review for a minute, and then we'll move on. All right, so what are the issues? Animal cells exchange material across the cell membrane. We need to get nutrients, fuel for energy, glucose mainly, oxygen, and we got to get rid of waste like urea and carbon dioxide. If you're a single-celled organism, no problem. But if you're many cells, that's a little harder. Remember that diffusion was not uh, adequate for moving things over large distances. It only works about one or two cell layers thickness with any degree of speed. So... We talked about that in a previous class. The um, answer, of course, is the circulatory system to deliver stuff right to the cells. Remember, that's called a um, closed circulatory system when you have the tubes lead right to the cells and the blood cells, like red blood cells, never leave the uh, tubes. All right, so simple diffusion. Uh, only a few animals have simple diffusion as their method of getting stuff from the food they eat to the cells of their body. And again, with things like the hydra and other cnidarians, they only have about two cell layers thickness uh, between their gastrovascular cavity, located here. This is uh, not a bird. It looks like a bird, but it's uh, Daphnia. It's a, almost microscopic, very tiny animal. So they just digest the Daphnia with enzymes, and the nutrients diffuse right into their cells. Easy peasy. However, we're a little more complicated. So the circulatory system solves this problem. We uh, carry fluids and dissolve materials throughout our body, and we can efficiently deliver stuff to all the cells of our body, overcoming the limitations of diffusion. So what's uh, needing to be transported? And you should uh, copy this down. This is some information that you have to have. We uh, need to deliver the nutrients that um, we get from the foods that we eat. We need to deliver oxygen and carbon dioxide to the various locations, specifically the lungs or the gills if you're a fish. We have an excretory system, gets rid of waste products from the cells, extra water, salts, nitrogenous wastes, like urea, that we'll talk about in a future class. So how do police officers get to a scene of a crime? Well, they take a police car. And to take a police car, you need roads. So roads kind of help the police get to scenes of crimes. And your circulatory system does something similar. Your white blood cells are basically the police of your body. They engulf invaders like bacteria that uh, want to eat you. And your immune system uh, is connected to the circulatory system. The lymphatic system has something called lymph nodes, which uh, have a lot of white blood cells, especially when you're um, infected. And uh, those white blood cells then get delivered to the circulatory system to uh, be delivered to the site of the infection. And regulation. We deliver hormones, which uh, only are required in a small amount, like testosterone and estrogen. However, uh, to deliver them from the various hormone-producing glands, like the pituitary gland, you need a delivery system. And that delivery system is the circulatory system of tubes. All right, circulatory system. So all animals have a circulatory fluid, some kind of blood. They all have tubes, blood vessels. Remember in plants, they were xylem and phloem. And they have a pump called the heart. Now, there is an exception to this. Not all animals have a muscular pump called the heart. The cnidarians, the very simplest of animals here, these guys don't have a heart. They don't have tubes. Same with uh, platyhelminthes, the flatworms, as well as the um, sponges, periphera. All right, so if you remember, an open circulatory system, and uh, again, if you feel like you uh, need to review and write this down, go ahead and do that. That was in a previous class, though. Uh, the blood leaves the tubes and circulates throughout the surrounding organs, and then it gets pumped back into this system of tubes, pumped through the heart, and then leaves the tubes again. So the blood of a grasshopper, or pretty much anything with an open circulatory system, is not different 
than the surrounding fluid around their organs. And um, this is not as efficient as a closed circulatory system because you're not delivering nutrients from the foods they eat uh, directly to the cells of the body. You have to rely on diffusion, which kind of limits the size of uh, animals that have an open circulatory system. I would imagine that the, um, the giant um, dragonflies and other animals of the prehistoric times probably didn't have as fast of metabolism as the smaller insects of today just because of the open circulatory system. You have to rely on diffusion. A larger organism requires more time to diffuse uh, nutrients, which means that they're not going to get the stuff to their cells to maintain a high metabolism. Here we have the closed circulatory system. The simplest animal with a closed circulatory system are the annelids, things like earthworms. So earthworms have a closed circulatory system, and they deliver stuff directly to their cells using the five pairs of hearts they have. Now all chordates, which includes fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, class savies, and mammals, have a closed circulatory system. So remember that, closed circulatory system, um, and that's going to come up in a second here. All right, so open circulatory system, invertebrates, animals without vertebra or a dorsal spinal cord, like insects, arthropods, and mollusks. There is one type of mollusk that has a closed circulatory system, and that's the uh, squids and octopi and their predators, which uh, maintains their high, uh, higher metabolism to chase prey. There's no distinction between the blood and the interstitial fluid, or the fluid that surrounds the cells. Extra means outside, and cell means cell, of course. So this is the fluid around the cells. Now, you should write this down. In fact, all this is kind of important. Please write it down. Uh, the fluid that uh, bugs have is not called blood. It's called something called hemolymph. Hemolymph is the bug blood, if you want to call it that, and it's not different from the fluid that surrounds the uh, organs. The red blood cells uh, leave their uh, tubes, and they're not even red. They have um, a different uh, molecule uh, for carrying oxygen that's very similar to hemoglobin, but it's called hemocyanin. And uh, hemocyanin is a, um, is a greenish color. So when you squish a bug, instead of being red, uh, typically you see this kind of a greenish, bluish uh, fluid, and that's called hemolymph, and that's their blood. And since they have a different, um, it's actually copper at the uh, center of their oxygen-carrying molecule, it's a slightly different color. Now, one of the things I like is Star Trek, and in Star Trek, they uh, show Spock being, like, greenish-colored, and one of the older uh, shows, they explained it as have, having uh, copper as his uh, uh, metal involved with his oxygen-carrying proteins, and they, like, totally stole that from what bugs do. All right, closed circulatory system. The red blood cells stay within the tubes, and that includes all vertebrates, and that's important to know and some invertebrates. Very few invertebrates have a closed circulatory system. But you should be familiar with the three that do. Earthworms, squid, and octopi. All three of them have a closed circulatory system. Now, the blood is confined to the vessels and separate from the interstitial fluid. Not the liquid. The liquid can leave, okay? We're talking about the cells inside the uh, tubes. And those cells stay within the tubes. All right, this is a review. Remember that the uh, fish have a uh, two-chambered heart, one atrium, one ventricle, and that one ventricle has to pump not only to the respiratory surfaces, the gills, but also to all the cells of the body. So that's a lot of work for one ventricle, and it's not as uh, uh, efficient as, uh, as some of the more complicated um, circulatory systems that we'll talk about. Over here we have the um, amphibian as well as uh, reptile basic heart uh, setup. We have one ventricle where we have mixing of blood between the oxygen pore on the uh, right hand side. It's the opposite. Imagine this is the uh, what you're looking at as far as patient. And a mixing of the blood from the left hand side, which is over here. It's the opposite of, of your left and right. All right, so since we have a mixing of blood here, that's going to be pumped with this one ventricle to the um, arteries. And these arteries are going to have a mixture of oxygen rich and oxygen poor. That's kind of a problem. There's no division or separation between those two sides of the heart. So uh, amphibians and reptiles can't maintain a super high metabolism because of the inefficiency of their uh, mixing of blood in the ventricle. And then we have the uh, mammal heart, uh, similar to the uh, bird heart, four chambers. And we have is an uh, adaptive value. Um, complete separation of the oxygen-poor blood from the oxygen-rich blood. 
And that's the big advantage that you should be familiar with. Separation of oxygen poor on the right-hand side from the left-hand side. That's left. Patient's left. All right, so the oxygen-rich blood is only pumped to the cells of the body. And then we have the oxygen-poor blood only pumped to the lungs to pick up more oxygen. So that's the, the most advanced system. And that allows us to maintain a high metabolism for uh, birds and mammals. All right, here we have another picture of that. Fish, two-chambered heart, one ventricle. That's pumped to the gills and the cells of the body. Amphibians and reptiles mixing of blood in there. Uh, even here in the reptiles, there's not a complete separation between the oxygen poor and oxygen rich. And then over here, we have the complete separation of blood, and we actually make two loops. We have one loop here, da, 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 to the lungs, that's called the pulmonary circuit. And then we have another loop, da, 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 to the cells of the body, and that's called the systemic circuit. All right, driving the evolution of cardiovascular systems. So the metabolic rate is the big issue. If you have complete separation of that blood, you can uh, get more oxygen to your cells, you can do more cell respiration, make more ATP, and you can do more high metabolic activities like flying or mammals being active at night or um, moving for a long period of time without uh, um, requiring a, a need for rest. The four-chambered heart has double circulation. You should know this. It's a, um, the increased pressure to the systemic circuit is not necessary to know, uh, but you should know. It prevents the mixing of oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood. And uh, this is important for warm-blooded endothermic animals. They require 10 times as much energy. We're high-maintenance creatures, and this uh, four-chambered heart uh, supports that. The uh, bird and mammal four-chambered heart evolve separate from each other but they are both four chambers. They both provide a survival advantage. All right, this ends part one of your notes on chapter 42, animal circulation.